Um, I think we'll try to get started. So as at this point, everyone probably has realized, uh, this is Leland Kins. Um, he's going to be talking to us today uh, on nearest neighbor descent and friends. Um, so Leland is a research mathematician at, is it Tutty or Tut? I always... Tut, Tut Institute. Tut, and uh, that's in Ottawa, Ontario. Um, I came to know Leland from his work on HDV Scan Star, um, but he's, I think, now probably more famous for UMAP, which is a dimension reduction technique that we hear you was at Stitch Fix for sure, and um, many other people have produced a lot of incredible, incre incredible work with. So I'll leave it there, and uh, Leland, let's go for it. All right, thank you. I, I want to thank Brian for inviting me, and I want to uh, thank Stitch Fix for, for hosting me for this. I, I greatly appreciate that. So today I want to talk about an algorithm and variations on it that I personally have been spending a lot of time working with lately. Uh, it's a relatively simple algorithm in many ways, which is kind of the beauty of it, but it's actually extremely effective at the task of finding nearest neighbors of data samples. So the first question to ask is, why nearest neighbors? Why, why would we care about finding nearest neighbors? Well, the, the short answer to that is that nearest neighbor computations are at the heart of a vast array of machine learning algorithms. There are the obvious things you can do, k-nearest neighbor classifiers, where you essentially predict the class of an unknown sample by taking a vote of the classes of its nearest neighbors. But you can turn that into a, a regression style algorithm with k-n regressors. This is all fine, but it's once you get into the land of unsupervised learning where this starts cropping up even more. If you look at uh, many of the powerful clustering algorithms that are out there, at their heart, they're really using nearest neighbor queries to get their work done efficiently. If you turn to dimension reduction techniques and manifold learning, as soon as you move out of matrix factorization techniques, which is really one class of, of dimension reduction, you're suddenly finding all the algorithms that aren't matrix factorization need some form of nearest neighbor queries as sort of the fundamental part of what they're doing. And that's often the core bottleneck on their performance. Um, if you are just doing simple information retrieval problems, like find me other things that look like this, that requires efficient nearest neighbor searching. So while nearest neighbors might have no place in lots of fancy deep learning techniques, they do provide a core algorithmic piece of many of the everyday workhorse algorithms in data analytics, data science, and machine learning generally. So what do we want out of a nearest neighbor algorithm? Well, we want to be able to search for a nearest or k-nearest items of a query point in sublinear time, because at the worst case, we could just compare it to all the training samples and compute the distances in linear time and just pick the, the shortest. So we really want sublinear. Ideally, we'd like something like log time. We also want to be able to build a k and n graph. That's a graph where each uh, data sample has a list of its k nearest neighbors, essentially edges to that those k nearest neighbors. That's a common task in a lot of these clustering and dimension reduction algorithms. We want to do that as fast as possible. Quadratic complexity is what you get if you did a linear scan for each and every point. We obviously want to manage to try and get something subquadratic. So what's the classical way to do this? The classical approach is space trees. Uh, I'm not going to go into a lot of detail on these. I'm just going to try and give a quick overview to give some idea of what the sort of classical approaches to doing this problem look like roughly. So the general idea of space tree type algorithms is to recursively split up the vector space into uh, sort of uh, finer and finer gradations so that you can then search a tree of your uh, data. Now there's some catches with this. Obviously I said split the space so you have to assume that your data is going to be nice and uh, vector formatted already. And at the heart of what's going on here, in a sense, is you're really just exploiting the triangle inequality to bound the search of the tree to find nearest neighbors efficiently. So here's a couple of pictures of a couple of different approaches to this. On the left is an example of a KD tree, which takes axis aligned divisions and uh, tries to carve up the space into essentially smaller and smaller rectangles or in higher dimensions, the sort of higher dimensional equivalent thereof. 
On the right, we have a vantage point tree or ball tree, which creates splits via balls of a fixed radius. And the goal here is you create a ball so that half the points are in the ball and half the points are outside the ball. And you just recursively do that, splitting the space as you go down. There are lots of other related ways of doing this sort of thing. They all have a similar sort of flavor. You're recursively building a tree, splitting the data at, e at each la uh, layer of the tree. So if you want to search for the nearest neighbors of a point, what you're going to do is find the leaf node of that tree that the query falls into. Now, the exact nearest neighbor of your query point may or may not be in that leaf. The leaf might be right on the boundary of a split, in which case the nearest neighbor, sorry, the query might be on the um, boundary of a split, in which case the nearest neighbors of it might be across the way in a different node. But this gives you a starting point because now you can compute the nearest neighbors of that point, uh, of the query point to all the things in the leaf. And you've got a bound on how far away the nearest neighbor can be. Uh, it, at worst, it can be the closest to the points you found in that leaf. And now you're gonna start working your way back up the tree. And essentially, what you want to ask yourselves is if the region of the node in the tree intersects the ball about the query of the current bound of the nearest neighbor that we know, then we're going to have to search down that branch of the tree. And if it doesn't, we know that the nearest neighbor can't possibly be in that sort of region of the space, so we can just dismiss it. So this actually quickly prunes down the, the search that you have to do. And as you find uh, closer and closer neighbors, you get to update the bound and continue. The upside of this is that this gives you a search complexity that's logarithmic in the number of training samples. So you can do a search very, very fast, far better than brute force searching. But one of the catches is that there are some constants tucked into that complexity bound. KD trees, for instance, have exponential search complexity in terms of the ambient dimension. So as you get to higher and higher dimensions, you have spent all your time backtracking up and searching, and at the end, you're really doing no better than pure brute force. So just for a moment, let's imagine what would happen if we didn't do backing, if we just went straight to that bottom leaf node and picked that. Well, we'd certainly gain on speed. Now we're guaranteed longer than complexity. We're just going straight to the bottom of the tree and everything is fine. The catch is, that we'll often not actually find the nearest neighbor. It could be in a neighboring node somewhere in the tree. Um, so we're gonna lose out on accuracy. We're not gonna be right a lot of the time. But while we're busy uh, not caring so much about accuracy, let's not bother with those carefully sorted out axis aligned median splits. What if we just picked a random split uh, in a random hyperplane direction each time? and built a tree that way. So these sorts of trees are called random projection trees or RP trees, and mm. they're certainly one way of doing things. Can I, can I push you back one slide for a second? So when you're doing the, yeah. oh, I think there's two slides, sorry. I mean, this is pretty, I wanna look at it, but <laughs> I have a question on one more. Um, <laughs> yeah, so, uh, uh, sorry, sorry, sorry. The one where you're saying like you're gonna bound the error. Um, I'm I'm wondering if like we can get some heuristic about the error as like a first, uh, as like a first gentle pass to try to like improve our performance just by like saying like oh we're gonna only allow the error to be bounded between between this range to speak. I don't know. That's kind of what I'm wondering is like how you cook up yeah. Yeah. those bounds. Yeah, uh, there's, so there's a lot of games you can play uh, to make these things uh, a little more uh, effective in this sort of approach. I, I don't want to get into the details of all of that. There's no problem. <laughs> uh, uh, books to be written <laughs> uh, or read on this subject. It, it's, it's pretty vast okay. because there's a lot of subtle variations on what you can do with the trees. So just to, I'm just going to push ahead. So sorry for not That's answering fine. your question at all, but uh, the, I, the story I want to tell at this point is really about the fact that let's go with this random projection approach. We're going to gain a whole lot of speed because we can build trees super cheaply. Uh, 
but our accuracy is going to be even worse because all those nice guarantees we got from the excess aligned median splits are just going to fall apart. So we're going to be terrible for accuracy, super fast for speed. But if we can build trees super cheaply, we could build a lot of them. And since all the trees are randomized, they're all going to be different and each tree is going to make different errors. So if we were to build enough trees and make an ensemble of these random trees, we could potentially get an answer almost as good as if we were doing the full backtracking, but we don't actually have to do any backtracking. So what we're going to end up with is that we've got a, a trade-off where the number of trees we have to build and the size of the leaves of those trees are hyperparameters that we can use to trade off between speed and accuracy. So if you build, uh, more trees with bigger leaf nodes, you'll be more accurate, but your search is going to be slower. Um, it's a trade-off you can make. And this leads to approaches like the Annoy library from Spotify, which does approximate nearest neighbor search extremely quickly. And so the, one of the key things I want to take away from this is that approximate nearest neighbor search actually will get the job done most of the time because it's fairly accurate. You can get like 99% accuracy a lot of the time. And if you're willing to sacrifice that 1% accuracy, you can get huge gains in how fast you can do this. Uh, so I think once we get to the performance stuff at the very, very end, uh, we'll see some of the differences between uh, uh, an exact method like KD trees and some of these more approximate methods that sacrifice a little bit of accuracy for a great deal of speed. But that's all tree-based algorithms. Um, what if there was another way to do things other than pure brute force searching that will still get us something really fast? So what is instead of the, a tree, our index was a graph. So the question is, what would it look like to query a graph? So I'm just going to go through a naive version of the algorithm. And since this is the core idea of a lot of what is going to follow, I'm going to go through it kind of slowly and then we'll tweak it as we go to make it a little more uh, efficient. But the basic idea is surprisingly simple. So suppose that we were magically handed a K nearest neighbor graph of the training data, and let's not worry about how we managed to get that just yet. The question is, could we use this as an index structure for searching for the nearest neighbors of new query points? And the answer is yes, and there's a very basic algorithm to do that. First, pick a random initial candidate list of these are what I think are the nearest neighbors and they can literally be random. What we're going to do then is expand our search along edges from the closest candidate to the query node. We add those neighboring nodes in our current candidate list. We're going to take our candidate list. We're going to sort it by distance to the query point. We're going to truncate off. So we've got just the top K candidates and then we're going to repeat. So I tend to like things visually. So here's uh, a, an animation of the algorithm. Before I, I start it, uh, what we have in blue is a graph of a very small number of nodes. The orange X is our query point, and we want to find the closest uh, things to that. And the red node is our initial candidate for our nearest neighbor. So what we're going to do is start that running. And is that actually displaying? Uh, yeah, I was able to see it. Okay. Uh, I'm not seeing it here, but that's okay. So uh, hopefully it's playing now. No? Yes, maybe. Um, I'm seeing it turn like purple, like one red dot and the, then the, the goal purple. Here. Yeah. Uh, so. Sorry, this one seems to be maybe, maybe stuck. Um, the, the goal is that we're just going to slowly walk along this graph and you'll see points uh, sort of get sorted through. Um, sorry that that's not working. I'm not quite sure why. So, oh, maybe now it is playing. Uh, so the goal is to have the um, extension along these uh, point edges. So we're going to gather up some new points. We're going to sort them uh, in order. I, I colored them green for sorting purposes, and then we're just going to truncate off, and we're just going to walk in steps. And each time, we're going to expand along the graph as we go, and we should get ever closer to that query point. Now, in this example, 
it's taking a fairly long time, partly because we're, we're walking through each step very slowly, but also uh, we're walking a large portion of the graph. So maybe this uh, algorithm doesn't look quite so sensible. But in part, that's really a law of small numbers problem. So if we go to a bigger graph here, uh, we could set this one running and we're going to walk through this graph and you'll see that in fact we touch rather fewer points. Uh, in fact, most of the graph doesn't get touched. We'll leave in gray all the, all the points in the graph that we're touching as we go. And it walks through the graph pretty steadily, marching towards that orange uh, query point, and we'll eventually uh, get to what is a, a fairly good solution to the problem. In each step, we're just expanding along the edges of the closest point, sorting everything, truncating off, and then going again and again and again. All right, uh, let's try a bigger, more complex example. Uh, it's almost hard to see, but the query point in orange is on the left-hand side now, and we're gonna be starting from the far right. And if we set that going, then you can see that it actually handles the sparse areas of the graph very well and just marches straight through those. It's the dense areas where it has to move a little more slowly and pick through, but it still avoids most of the points. So in practice, in terms of computing distances to the query point, we're computing very few distances relative to the total volume of, of points we could be distances for. And it still successfully marches its way all the way across uh, to the query point in relatively short period of time. Okay, so what are the pros and cons of this sort of approach? Well, one of the pros is that the algorithm is super straightforward and easy. Uh, I gave an overview of how the space tree algorithms work, but in practice, every tree has a lot of complications and it's difficult to get those just so often. But this is a very straightforward algorithm, just walking through a graph in a very simple to implement way. Another thing that it does very well is it adapts to the intrinsic dimension of the data. That's because it's making use of that K&N graph. So it follows the data distribution. And so you can avoid the large sort of vast areas of the ambient space that are essentially empty of data if your data has sort of intrinsic dimension much lower than the ambient dimension of the vector space the data happens to be lying in. So this is a definite advantage over most tree-based approaches. And if you're particularly interested in dimension reduction manifold learning type approaches, this certainly makes a lot of sense. Another advantage is that it doesn't actually require true metrics. We aren't relying on the triangle inequality to do our heavy lifting anymore. We can use all sorts of different similarity measures if we want. Now, it should be noted that there are still the similarities which can badly break this approach, but they tend to be mostly fairly pathological. There are some papers by uh, Jacob Barron and Richard Darling, which actually do a, a wonderful job of looking at some of these sorts of cases. One of their prototypical examples is if you build a dissimilarity metric out of longest common subsequence of a string, uh, you can end up in a case where things work very badly. So why does this approach tend to break? It's when the uh, friend of a friend principle, as they put it, fails to work. If, uh, I'm, if A is close to B and B is close to C, ideally one expects A and C to be somewhat close. If you have longest common substring, you could have B being the concatenation of A and C, and in practice, A will be close to B, C will be close to B, but neither will be potentially at all close to each other. And that's when this sort of approach does tend to break. On the other hand, space trees are not going to handle that very well either. But one of the main right, advantages right. is that this can actually be very, very, very efficient. Yeah. Um, you broke up a little bit, I felt like, uh, at your punchline. <laughs> could, you, uh, could you just repeat, like, so in the, in the friend of friend, like, complication, um, mm -hmm. these still don't do well, but they still do better, more, more well than the like high dimensional space trees version. Uh, or... Essentially, yeah. Uh, nothing does, uh, I know of nothing that does well in that case, uh, is what <laughs> I can say. Um, if people have uh, algorithms that do work well in those sorts of cases, I would love to hear about them because it's a very challenging case. They're 
pathological distance functions that it's hard to work with. Um, cool. All right. So, so uh, this can be super efficient, uh, oddly enough. Uh, it only really started to show on those graphs that I animated through a little bit, but it, it really can get you to an answer a lot faster, even than space tree based methods. But there are some real big catches. Uh, one of the first is that it's not guaranteed to give you the true nearest neighbors. There's just no guarantees on this. The search can get stuck in a local minima, especially if your stack of uh, candidates that you're keeping is too small. It's quite easy to get stuck in local minima. Um, so you have to sort of increase that. And so as long as you're willing to accept approximate nearest neighbor search that works most of the time, this will get the job done. But if you do have a need for finding the true nearest neighbors, this algorithm is not going to work out for you. And one of the other big downsides, once again, lack of guarantees, there's no explicit asymptotic complexity bounds that I know of on this. Uh, there are there's some uh, general cases, but uh, in the space tree case, there was the, uh, there were those data dependent constants that sort of were uh, shuffled away related to say the ambient dimension of the data. Here, that all comes into the nature of the graph that gets constructed when you build this uh, k-nearest neighbor graph that you're going to search on, and that complicates a lot of these complexity estimation approaches uh, a great deal. Okay, but that was the naive algorithm. What would we do to make this an efficient algorithm? How much do we have to tweak it to actually make it run really fast? Because a lot of the time when you have these nice pseudocode algorithms, if you look up a pseudocode algorithm for KDE trees, for example, uh, the search algorithm looks very straightforward. When you try and actually code it up efficiently, there's, there's catches. Uh, there's always catches with these things. What are the catches like here? Well, there are a bunch of ways we can fine tune this search algorithm a bit. One of the obvious ones is to keep a hash table of the nodes that have already been tried and make sure we don't bother to look at any of those. That's simple enough. A more interesting trick is that we can keep track of two heaps. Uh, so instead of sorting and truncating, as we had in the, the basic algorithm that I was describing, we can keep a, a min heap or essentially a priority queue of, of which node I want to expand so that I can always just uh, pop off the queue, the node that is currently the closest untried node to the query. Uh, so uh, I could always just pop those off the front of the queue and a max heap of the top K candidates so that if I want to keep track of the, the top K, I don't have to sort and then truncate. I always know the top of the max heap is going to be the furthest of the K and I can instantly check whether I'm uh, 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 going to be worth adding to that uh, heap or not. And then the heap is going to keep it sorted for me essentially as I go. I think, so I, I, think I lost uh, track a little bit here because I'm, I, I kind of, it's not immediately obvious to me like what what is in the heap as we move through this process that we're adding and subtracting to? So like it, yeah. Can you maybe help my intuition? Uh, okay. So uh, we are working with the Ken nearest neighbor graph uh, yes. of our, our uh, training data. Um, so what is going into the, these heaps is uh, the node or the index into the data of uh, each point that is their potential candidate for being a nearest neighbor, along with its distance and that's provided to the query point and that's providing our sorting for the heap. Mm -hmm. So the min heap is going to have the thing that's closest to the query node at the top. The max heap is going to have the thing that's furthest from the query node at the top and we're going to keep that max heap uh, so that it only ever has K elements in it. That's easy enough to arrange. Uh -huh. And so it's just there basically in the same way that we talked about uh, having a list of candidates and then sorting them, we are going to be doing that via yeah. two different heaps. Um, yeah. The two heaps just so that we can sort in both directions at the same time. And one of them, we just get to pop things off the top of the heap as a priority queue of which thing to expand next. And that way we also don't have to keep track of which ones we've already expanded or not. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. My intuition so is the last. Okay. The last thing we want 
able to arrange for here is uh, when to stop. So the obvious thing to do is when the thing we pop off the top of our min heap is further away than the top of our max heap. In other words, uh, the next node we want to expand from to find new candidate neighbors is already further away than the furthest away of our top K list. Uh, we can tweak that a little bit and have it be a one plus epsilon times that distance. The epsilon then is a, a hyperparameter that much in the same way that the uh, annoy had the number of trees and leaf size as parameters to trade off speed versus accuracy, this epsilon value lets us trade off speed versus accuracy. If we have a slightly larger epsilon that allows us in a sense to backtrack a little and avoid some of those local minima, it increases the accuracy of the search at the cost of the speed because we're going to have to potentially backtrack a few times when maybe that wasn't the best idea. So all of that comes together into this, which is Python code for that search algorithm. Now, I'm not really expecting you to stare at this code and take it all in or anything like that. There are some comments there that you should be able to see roughly where the parts of the algorithm are fitting in. The key takeaway I want you to get from this is that this is actually the high performance implementation I'm going to be uh, benchmarking later in the talk. Uh, this is the fast implementation of, the, of that algorithm. It is actually the simple, I can fit it all on one slide. Uh, and, and that's really the important thing. This is actually a very, very simple algorithm and you can do a lot with it. All right, so the next thing I wanna talk about is tuning the graph for queries. We assumed we were given a K and N graph and used it directly as an index, but maybe we could tweak it to be a little bit better. So by default, we would get a directed graph. A K nearest neighbor graph should have K outgoing edges from each point to its K nearest neighbors. But when I was walking us through that search algorithm, it was using an undirected graph. And that actually does matter. Being considered a neighbor by another node is as meaningful as considering the other node to be your neighbor. So having this sort of reverse direction matters. So turning it into an undirected graph is the right thing to do, but this raises a new problem, which is, is hubness, which is the tendency in high dimensional spaces for a point that's slightly more central than others to have many, many, many points that all consider that point to be one of their nearest neighbors. So I can, I can show this in 2D with this uh, one nearest neighbor graph. So here's the directed version of the graph. Every node has picked out its nearest neighbor if we go and turn that into an undirected first nearest neighbor graph, what we get is this. And the thing to take away from this is that that central blue node now has degree four. It's got four uh, incident edges, which is a lot higher than the one nearest neighbor that we were working from. And it gets much, much worse in higher dimensions. As you go up in dimensions, you can end up with hundreds or even thousands of incident edges in even just a 10 nearest neighbor graph. Such hubs are really expensive to expand in search because we're going to expand along all the edges incident on a node, or you're going to be uh, comparing hundreds or thousands of points to the query. That's kind of expensive. We're still, because of the nature of such hubs being connected to everything, we're almost certain to go through them at some time. So the ideal world, well, uh, it's unclear what to do, but we could just limit the maximum number of edges incident on a node. So we could restrict to say the 20 closest. I'm saying 20 for say a 10 nearest neighbor graph on the basis that, as I said, we do want some of those uh, points that consider this node to be a neighbor rather than being a neighbor of this node. The reverse edges, if you like. So we're gonna have it higher than whatever the K is for our K nearest neighbor graph, but we're gonna truncate off at some point but we can actually go a little further and prune edges a little more intelligently. The goal is to remove essentially the redundant edges first. So here's uh, this case. Let's, let's just look at this. The short edges there from green to blue and from blue to red are gonna be needed in any of these searches. Uh, we're gonna have to work with them at some point, but the longer edge from green to red is an edge that 
in terms of the search, we'd have to do two hops instead of one, but we'd still manage to expand along those two shorter edges and get from the green to the red node eventually. So on, on some level, that extra green to red edge is a little bit redundant, so we could get rid of it. So what we're gonna do is prune longer edges that aren't required for our search to work and get rid of those first. So here's how we can uh, do this. We're gonna work systematically. So let's consider the blue node there. Uh, we're gonna keep the nearest neighbor, the purple node. We definitely need the nearest neighbor. And then you're gonna work out to the next nearest neighbor. The second nearest neighbor is red. It's closer to blue than it is to any of the neighbors re retained so far, which is just purple. So, okay, we keep that. Now our list of kept nodes is purple and red. We look at green and it turns out that green is closer to red, one of our retained things, than it is to blue. And so what we're gonna do is say, okay, we don't need that edge because when we're doing our search, we're gonna be able to get to green from blue by going through red. That's, that's gonna be guaranteed because green is gonna end up in red's list of retained neighbors. So this provides a way to prune the graph down of edges that are in a sense redundant to our search. They might make the search faster in some sense, but uh, it, it helps alleviate these hubness problems. So this makes it a little more complicated. We're gonna prune the directed graph, then we're gonna reverse the graph to get the uh, edges all going in the other direction and prune the reverse directed graph. Then we can union all of that together into an undirected graph and we still might end up with hubs that have far too high a degree, far too many incident edges. We're just gonna prune those away in much the way I described. At some point you, you have to give up and take what you can get. So the thing is that that sounds a little complicated, but these adjustments actually make considerable difference to the resulting search performance, especially for high dimensional data. So it's worth taking into account these sorts of games you can play to refine the graph. I'd love to hear other ideas for how one could further refine a graph for search like this. But I haven't told you how to build this graph in the first place. I can tweak a graph if I've been given one, but how do I get it in the first place? Well, could we build that index graph that we want via the search procedure we talked about? Ostensibly, yes, but how would we do that? Well, there's, there's two ways you could think about doing this. You could start by incrementally adding points. So you're gonna start with a graph on two points, that's easy to build, and then I'm gonna add a new point and search in that graph that I've got so far to add a new point and so on, adding new edges as I go. Alternatively, I could start with a graph on all the points, whether it's a good graph or not, and use the search procedure for like one iteration or so, refine everything, fix up my graph, and now I've got a better graph to search on, rinse, repeat. So let's look at the incrementally adding points version first. So here we're gonna incrementally add points to the graph, and what we get out of that is what's called a small world graph. It has some long edges, but most of the edges are short and connecting near neighbors to each other. So here's a demonstration of that process, and it just builds up the graph as it goes, adding new points, uh, adding in the edges as you go, and you can see that what you end with is mostly adding short edges. There are those long edges that are introduced at the start, but you get a decent approximation. It's a decent search graph. Um, note, however, that a lot of the early edges, uh, a lot of the early nodes get edges that are incident on them. So we could instead just keep the top K edges for each node, updating the graph and thus removing edges as we go. And we get something more like this. So points are colored by their arrival order, just so you can see what's going on. And this time the graph sort of refines itself steadily to be actually a pretty good approximation of the nearest neighbor graph. So this line of thinking leads us to algorithms like uh, SW graph, that's for a small world graph. Uh, and this is actually a, a fairly popular algorithm. It's been superseded by what I'm about to uh, get to next, which is the fact that data order matters in this construction. The order in which I introduce the points determines the graph and pathological orders are entirely possible. We've got to be very careful about that. In fact, a lot of the order that data might naturally be in is potentially a pathological order for this sort of construction case. Uh, 
So we could randomize the whole thing a little bit by randomly assigning points to different hierarchical layers. The point is going to be assigned to a layer and all layers below it. And I'm going to build the graph at um, all these different layers. And that's going to be useful later on because I now I've got a hierarchical set of graphs. I can use that in my search. So what I'm going to do is search the top layer, which has very few points. And then that'll find me an entry point into the next layer down where I can search that graph very quickly and so on down. So that when I'm searching that full graph at the bottom most layer, I already have a good starting point. And this gives uh, HNSW, Hierarchical Navigable Small World Graph, a nearest neighbor search. And that's actually some of the current state of the art for approaches for approximate nearest neighbor search. Uh, I've got the, the paper referenced here and at least a couple of implementations. There are actually quite a few implementations out there now. That's one approach. The other approach is to update the graph instead of introducing nodes incrementally. So what would that look like? Let's start with a bad graph and try and improve a, a bad graph. Well, what's a bad graph? We could just start with a random graph, just randomly assign points as having neighbors and work from there. So what we're going to do is each node we can do, it has its neighbors and we can expand along the graph each of those neighbors and then resort our candidate list, re-rank, and then collapse down to a, a, a K neighbor set for that. So if we apply that approach, we would get something that looks sort of like this, where we start with a completely random graph. And as each node refines things, it's going to improve the graph until steadily we actually get a pretty good approximation of the nearest neighbor graph. As we get towards the end, you can see it slows down quite a lot. There's a lot fewer improvements to be found or made. But really, all we're doing is one step of the search procedure for every node and then rinsing repeating as we go. So Here's uh, what we uh, actually did there. We started on iteration zero with a terrible graph. It was random after all, and it was 1% correct uh, of the true K nearest neighbor graph. But after touching every node and updating the graph, after the first iteration through of every node, we've actually improved to something that's already 36% complete. So this is a pretty dramatic improvement. But more importantly, now that our graph is better, it's a better graph for doing that search on. So our next iteration, which does one step of that search procedure for every node, gives us now a 95% accurate graph. Iteration three, we get up to 99% accuracy. Iteration four, definitely diminishing returns here. There are very few edges that are incorrect, so it's hard to catch them all. We can get up iteration five to 99.6%, but at this point, uh, we're sort of effectively stuck in a local minima. You can keep iterating on this. It doesn't improve that much. Still, it's a, a very good approximation of the K-nearest neighbor graph, actually significantly better than the incrementally adding points gave you. So one thing we can do is bulk process each iteration holding the graph fixed. So instead of updating a single node and then updating the graph each and every time, we can fix the graph, calculate, the results for each node and then update the graph with all of those results. So each iteration holds the graph fixed until you've processed all the nodes and then you update everything. Uh, this makes it a lot easier to parallelize things and actually it helps with uh, convergence to a degree because you're holding the graph fixed. You get a, little, a lot less of the noise going on as you go. So that would look like this. We're starting with the same random graph, 1% correct. By the first iteration, we're a little better, maybe 36%. But by the second iteration, we've already hit 99% correct. And by the third, we're 100% correct, at least in this simple case. Uh, for more complicated data, obviously, we're not going to get to 100% and certainly not in three iterations. But this is the core idea of the nearest neighbor descent algorithm, which uh, Dong Charakar Lee published in 2011. And there's at least a couple of implementations of it. A K graph, which is the first one listed there, is by the original authors of the paper. And I have my own implementation, which I've, I've listed below. Um, so we don't have to start from a random graph. In the earlier case, we talked about Anoy, which used these random projection trees 
random projection trees were very fast to build, but they were, you had to build a lot of them. We don't care about being very accurate. We just care about being a little bit accurate. So we can build a very small number of these random projection trees to get a starting point. It just has to be better than pure random and we're making progress. So if we try with just a few trees, oddly enough on this uh, data example I had, we already get to 71% accuracy before we're started. The first iteration bumps that up to 98% accuracy straight away. And the second iteration, we're already 100% and we're done. So this actually gives you, giving you a, a sort of starting boost like this goes a long way. Even better, if we're gonna use this graph for search, if we have these RP trees in the background, we can use them to initialize the search as well which can speed up the search procedure in much the same way that HNSW manages to have its hierarchical layers of graph. Here we could use one random projection tree to get started and then uh, do the graph search from there from an already good starting point. So that was the algorithm. We actually want to implement our soft tweaks that are necessary to make it efficient. So, the thing is that one level of expansion is up to the neighbor of my neighbor, which is really a pair of nodes uh, that have edges to a given common node. So thinking about that pictorially, we can think about green trying to expand itself. It has a current neighbor, which is blue, and then you expand out to the expansion node, which is red. But you can flip your thinking and think in terms of the blue node and say, ah, I have edges connecting to these two common nodes, neighbor A and neighbor B, and what I really should do is introduce A to B. So you can almost think of this as like a cocktail party sorting algorithm where everyone uh, has people they have common interests with and they just make sure they introduce all their friends who have common interests with them to each other and very quickly you end up with everyone talking to everyone about common interests. So Feeling. this is really, yeah, there's a there's a question in the Q and A that um, Sven asked. Uh, can you yeah. see the question? Uh, no, sorry. Uh, is there value in searching on a random subgraph first to find the closest point of the subgraph and then searching on the full graph uh, that as a starting point? Potentially, actually, um, that would be a, a an interesting game to play. Um, I haven't given that much thought, but <laughs> maybe we can uh, discuss a bit more uh, at the end. I'm I sort of running shortish on time, so Go I want to try it. and get through everything else so yeah. far. All right. Yeah. So um, the next step you can take to improve things is that you only want to introduce your new acquaintances to everybody. So in other words, uh, I already know that I've introduced uh, these acquaintances that are already new to each other because I did that last iteration. Only uh, acquaintances that are new to me need to be introduced to all my current acquaintances. So that requires a bit of bookkeeping, but it's not too onerous to manage to do. We also need to put a limit on the number of introductions done in an iteration. This is really that hubness problem that we talked about from search. Hubs are going to have far too many acquaintances and it's just going to get hairy to compute. So again, there's a extra bit of bookkeeping because we have to keep track of who got introduced and who didn't from each point of view. But again, this is, this is a slightly tedious bookkeeping operation rather than being overly complicated. Lastly, early stopping. Uh, you may have noticed those last few iterations of the graph uh, uh, really had very marginal improvement. You can just keep track of how much uh, new uh, updates to the graph you have and say, well, okay, uh, we can just stop here. We're, we're not making much progress anymore. And so unfortunately the code for this doesn't fit on a screen anymore uh, due to all that nasty bookkeeping, but it's still actually conceptually very simple. So performance, because I keep talking about this being efficient, how efficient is it? So let's compare with other nearest neighbor search implementations. And uh, Eric Bernhardson, uh, the creator of Annoy, actually built a great benchmarking suite for approximate nearest neighbor search implementations. So I would recommend you check that out if you ever want to try and play these sorts of games. The other thing to note is that a lot of these libraries in C++ with a very thin Python binding on top 
Um, my implementation, if you want to play with it, uh, is in pure Python using number for acceleration. So I personally find the code a lot more approachable in, in the just nice, easy, pure Python. It does have some things that uh, number can't do some things that C++ can at this point. Uh, most particularly, I think things related to uh, forcing memory prefetching and so on. But that just means we're maybe a little slower than the fastest C++ implementations. So here is a chart uh, showing a whole slew of different implementations of algorithms. And the way you want to read this is uh, further up and to the right is better because along the bottom axis is the accuracy of your nearest neighbor query over this data set. Ideally, you want sort of 100% accuracy or 1.0, um, but there's a trade-off. If you are willing to accept less accuracy, you can get the y-axis to go higher and get more queries completed every second. So you can see that the sort of accuracy speed trade-off in place for bunches of different implementations. So my implementation, uh, Pioneer Descent, is in the dark red. And as you can see, it's, it's competitive with those C++ libraries. The fastest options up there are almost all different HNSW implementations. But it's worth noting that the, the um, Facebook research has an implementation of HNSW. And Pioneer Descent is actually a little faster than that, which leads me to believe that Algorithmically, there aren't really that many differences between these approaches. It's more to do with uh, just implementation efficiency. Um, so you can go through other different data sets. Higher dimensional, again, you'll see at the top, all the algorithms that are doing very well are these graph-based algorithms. They're all HNSW or Pioneer Descent or KGraph. And down at the bottom are uh, the slowest ball tree algorithms, KD tree algorithms, they're much, much slower for the most part. So these graph-based algorithms are uh, dominant. You can zoom in and look at the high accuracy range performance. So now I'm just looking at recall accuracy between 90% and 100%. And you can see that uh, you can get very, very efficient uh, thousands of queries per second and still be at like 99% accuracy with some of these graph based algorithms. Same holds for this uh, higher dimensional data set. It's obviously gets a bit harder, but it's still very efficient. You can also do angular distances just as well. Here's a uh, glove uh, word vector based data set. You can find nearest neighbors on this extremely efficiently. Um, this is a TF IDF based uh, data set. And again, if you zoom in to the high recall situation, you're actually still doing very, very well right up to the very end before these start to really dip. Uh, same with the TF idea. Uh, the index construction actually even is very fast and parallelizable. So um, constructing an approximate 15 nearest neighbor graph on uh, the MNIST digits data set of 784 dimensions, 70,000 data points, I can get that done with this sort of approach in 10 to 20 seconds on a MacBook Pro. If I use uh, good KD tree implementations, it can easily take 30 or 40 minutes. So the efficiency of doing this is actually really, really high just in pure index construction. So if the thing you want to get to at the end of the day is a KNN graph, this will get you there almost immediately because that is your index that you're building. So you don't even need to build the index and then do the queries. Just building the index potentially gives you your answer. So just to round out some conclusions, uh, nearest neighbor descent and these other similar algorithms, because they are all very similar at the end of the day, provide actually extremely efficient approximate nearest neighbor search, way better than the classical space tree type algorithms. As long as you're willing to take approximate nearest neighbor, you can do so much better in terms of queries per second on the order of uh, thousands or tens of thousands instead of tens or hundreds. And better yet, the algorithms are relatively simple to code and the software to do this actually looks fairly simple for the most part. And there are already plenty of inf uh, implementations out there that you can work from. So last of all, here's a slide with uh, almost all the uh, different implementations and repositories I link to. So you can take some, take some notes of those and pick out whichever ones are your favorites. All right, thank you. Thank you so much, Leland. This is really awesome. Um, yeah, I, 
if anyone has any questions, uh, you can post in the either the chat or in the Q and A, and we can unmute you if you want to ask directly. Uh, we have a few more minutes left. For anybody, for anyone on the call right now, you can also use the raise your hand feature. I'll be keeping an eye on that if anybody does want to speak and uh, we can get you on the call. Yeah, I, uh, I just uh, allowed you to talk, Sven, if you want to ask. Sure, does this work? Yep. Yes. Oh, great. Well, yeah, no, excellent talk. I really enjoyed that. Um, thinking about this problem. So uh, I had this question about these random subgraphs. It seemed like um, to give a little more context on your kind of uh, examples a little bit earlier in the talk on these large graphs where you had this animation, it seemed to work very efficiently in this sparse set where it could make big hops. So that made me think about having like, like kind of long edges that jump across the graph would be rather helpful in, in kind of when you're far away. So I was kind of curious, like, a random subgraph or other ways to add kind of long edges uh, along with kind of the k nearest neighbors, whether how that would impact the search speed. So I was yeah, okay. So when you when you phrase it that way, uh, yeah, I think what you want to be looking at for that is um, something like the HW algorithm, uh, because what it's doing there is at the top layer it has uh, a graph with very, very few elements in it, which is just a, a small, very small subgraph. And that naturally has those long edges that you're talking about because it's, it doesn't have most of the points in it. It searches that graph first. And then by using that, it can then find an entry point in the next graph because it's going to find the equivalent point in the next, next layer graph down. So it, it's basically uh, stacking a whole bunch of layers of what you're describing uh, to do its efficient search. Um, how much you gain from doing that is unclear. I have seen some papers that tried to demonstrate that in fact, uh, for the most part, that gives you less of a win than you might think. Not that it's not beneficial, but that the actual benefit is small. I'm not entirely sure I believe that, but I think they were interesting results. From my own experience playing with this, I would say that uh, in my case, I found that having the random projection trees as a starting point, as opposed to uh, a simpler graph, actually was surprisingly effective. And I ended up going with that uh, just because it, it worked better for the cases I was playing with. And I was already building them for the index construction for other efficiency reasons. So it's a bit of a trade-off. It doesn't take a lot of improvement to make a, 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 you only have to have a somewhat decent starting point and then the algorithm is very, very fast. So as long as you can get close-ish in that early stage, I think that'll do a lot of the work of not having to need those long edges. On the other hand, maybe the long edges are how you get to that uh, close starting point. That's certainly how HNSW thinks about it. Cool, thanks. Awesome. Um, if there's no other questions, um, I just want to thank you again. This was super fascinating. Um, I, yeah, yeah, I have a lot to think about. <laughs> cool, thanks so much, right. Leland. And, uh, thank for being the, the first member of our speaker series. So this All is right. exciting. Thanks so. so much for having me. Greatly appreciate yeah. it. Thank you, Owen. Right. Thanks. Have a great one. Thanks, everyone. Thank Have a good one.